Professor Mohammed Abdallah. I'm a consultant physician. My background is training in kidney medicine mainly. And initially I worked with the University of Nairobi for a number of years and then retired. And after retirement I went to the Aga Khan Hospital. Uh, worked there until it converted into a university. So I was now working as a professor of medicine in the Aga Khan University until last month when I retired. So now I've gone home to the coast where I'm now doing very light work. Still doing clinical work, but uh, mainly, if you like, philosophizing, <laughs> uh, assisting in setting up systems, setting up processes, doing think tank more than clinical work at the moment. I'm taking it easy. Excellent. I think and my priority is my grandchildren now. <laughs> yeah, I decided from the beginning of my life that I need to give from those who give to me. So right through, uh, as I did my medical career on the one side, I actually also volunteered to do voluntary work. In the initial stages, it was mainly voluntarism in health. So doing camps, doing workshops, doing giving, if you like, uh, without charges. And that literally constituted around 40% of my time. So it was a heavy chunk. Um, and 60%, of course, was sufficient as far as I was concerned to do my own work, which was mainly giving services in health, doing research, and academia, which is what my line is. But as the years went by, I increased the philanthropic bit more and more. So now, in fact, I'm more into philanthropic organizations. Kenya Community Development Foundation is only one, but I'm in a number of other philanthropic organizations where um, either I'm participating or leading processes where giving is the main objective. And I've done that up to now and I hope to increase that even more as, as I retire now uh, into, into this kind of life. And I feel when, when you really look into it in life, you can organize yourself and do a lot of giving without losing much because I've managed. I've, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I've improved my life. I've educated my children without losing anything as I gave. Now, in terms of the Kenya Community Development Foundation, which was literally part of my search for giving uh, to others, I got involved mainly in brainstorming uh, into these activities uh, because I was looking for how do you help communities to assist themselves. <clears throat> the main thing about uh, philanthropism in, in our culture is somebody is in need, you give him at that particular moment and then it's done and then he comes back again tomorrow for more and more and more. Uh, and that causes fatigue. But if you find ways and means of allowing them to sustain themselves, then even if at the beginning the giving is higher and more complex, but in the end it becomes easier because then they don't come back. So I was looking for that kind of situation and I found it in KCDF. I found a group of other enthusiasts who were looking at the same thing. And so we spent probably maybe two, three years just brainstorming in people's houses. You go into so-and-so's house in the evening and we brainstorm and have dinner and go away and come back after two, three weeks and do it again in another house and another house. Uh, and then we hooked in some possible stakeholders, donors mainly, who also had similar interests in, in this. And at that time, particularly Ford Foundation and, uh, and the Aga Khan Foundation, who are also interested in this. So we were brainstorming together, actually. Nothing formal, nothing fixed as such, uh, until we kind of organize ourselves into something. So luckily at that time, both the foundations agreed to become joint partners. Ford Foundation at that time Although, okay, we were enthusiasts, we were committed, but we were not an entity yet. So it became obvious that if there was going to be any official giving or help, it had to come through a formalized system. And the Aga Khan Foundation was kind enough to agree to make us a project within the Aga Khan Foundation. So that's how KCDF started, actually, as a project 
of the Aga Khan Foundation. So uh, Ford Foundation gave the initial grant to Aga Khan and we administered it. And uh, as a project, we formed what we at that time called a national committee. And the reason for calling it national is because we wanted to go countrywide, not necessarily any particular geographical area. So we started like that and we formed a national committee. I was a member of the national committee and uh, we worked like that for quite a while. And uh, finally, as we evolved, as we grew, as we gained experience, we decided maybe we should become an entity ourselves. And so we launched the Kenya Community Development Foundation at that point and registered it as such. And I became the founder chair uh, from that time until now. So here I am in the Kenya Community Development Foundation doing exactly what I've always wanted to do. Yes, uh, in KSDF there were, there was a couple of observations that we felt were critical. Number one, uh, the usual thing that is done by other organizations where you go to a marginalized community, you start in the morning and you finish in the evening and you give them blankets and you give them a bottle of Coca-Cola and you give them a piece of cake and you think you've done something. Okay, they're happy that day and then what happens the following day? And the following, you've helped for one day you haven't helped for the other 364 days. So we felt that wasn't enough. It was not sustainable. That community then remains marginalized otherwise. So we felt the best thing is empower them so that they can do it for themselves. Now, that means a lot of commitment, several things immediately. That means then you are a long-term partner, not a one-day thing and then you take photographs and you say, we did it. But you're now talking about several years of holding somebody's hand until they get where they're getting. That is issue number one. The other observation we made at that time was that even if you were to give and give in a substantial way, let's say for example a community wants to pay school fees for their children and you feel all right if you want to do that why don't we find an entrepreneurship of some sort let's say you know we'll, we'll uh, help you to raise chicken, sell the eggs or sell the chicken <laughs> for that matter and buy new ones and whatever profit you get you do that. Now we've seen other organizations do exactly that. They parachute in into a community, set up the whole thing for them, do a very complex organization with heavy technologies involved and know-how and skills and so on. You do that for about six months and then you say, okay, here's the key. Now you do it. Now you never allowed them to plan with you. You never capacity built them in any way whatsoever. You didn't give them the technical know-how. You assumed that when you give them the key, they'll take it from there. You come back after six months, all you have is a banda with a lot of feathers in it, <laughs> but no chicken. Because they didn't want, no. You came in like a tornado and you went away and you didn't do anything. So we felt hand in hand with all that, you needed to capacity build people so that they can actually take over and do with the skills that other professionals have in doing whatever it is they do, whether it is raising goats or raising chicken or selling mattresses, it doesn't really matter what the community has chosen. But they have to have skills in doing whatever it is they're supposed to do. So that's, that's how we differed from other organizations, all other organizations in this country for that matter, who just come and give and go. We actually insisted that as we partner with anybody, before we even issue the first check, we want to be sure, number one, they are highly selected. Number two, they have potential uh, to be able to be taught and to get where they're supposed to go. And number three, they have gained enough skills and capacity before they get the first check. That normally takes several months. Uh, and this is something that is not understood by the bigger donors. <coughs> and, and this is usually not understood by the bigger donors. So when you get people like the World Bank or the Japanese aid or the overseas development aid from the British or whoever they are, the international donors, they don't understand that part of it, that people you give must have the technical know-how to receive. They must have the capacity to receive. <clears throat> so we found out over the years that the, the major international donors do not understand that part of the process. Uh, over the years in KCDF we have discovered you need probably something like 20% of the investment in training and capacity building. 
So when you go to people like the World Bank or Ford Foundation or any other bigger organization and you tell them whatever you give us, 20% of it will be spent on training and capacity building, but normally the answer is no. The money must go to the community and do what it's supposed to do. And you tell them it will not do because it will just get spoiled. So we have that major issue uh, with the international donors. Uh, uh, but I think over the years now, as we dialogue with them, they have seen for themselves that our model is working and is working well. So I, I'm, I, we are hoping that as we meet perhaps with other like-minded organizations from Africa, we can actually share experiences with them and find out what their own experiences are. But I think we have found out in this country that that is actually major. That's issue number one. And then issue number two, of course, is that uh, whereas the other major donors out there are already well endowed, you'll find it's a government organization, for example, like USAID, JICA, GTZ, these are all government outfits. And so they get their money from Treasury. They don't have to go and struggle for the, for the, for the resources. Or, indeed, it will be a foundation that has been created out of a large business, Ford Foundation, other charitable organizations, Welcome Foundation and Welcome Trust and so on, pharmaceutical industries and so on. And in this country, we've started having that kind of uh, process coming up. Safaricom and GM Motors and everybody else seem to be setting up their own foundations uh, for corporate social responsibility. Uh, we would like to see for example, if we are going to have any impact in this country, that they will probably want to work with organizations like your CDF uh, for one simple reason. One, if we put our resources together, we can achieve more. That's issue number one. Issue number two, Safaricom or GM Motors and so on are in their business of doing whatever they're supposed to do, sell cars or sell phones and so on, uh, they are not in the business of assisting communities, setting their skills and capacity building them to do whatever they are supposed to do. So the best thing is subcontract an organization that does exactly that. Uh, just like in business, you subcontract a skilled outfit to do something for you. But there's one major challenge, and the challenge is a lot has been stolen in this country in the name of exactly that. People get together and they, they take resources and they are never seen again. And, and so when you do go to organizations that do have, and you say, can we put our resources together and so on, it's like, how do we know you're not one of them? That you're going to run away with resources, that you'll put monies together and then just disappear out of this world. So there's an issue of trust uh, that is looming large right now. So every organization feels we'll set our own thing and do our own thing, but they can't. If you come into Kenya Community Development Foundation, you'll find it's a whole bunch of professionals who are hired to do exactly what they're supposed to, to do. Whereas if you were to go to Safaricom or you're supposed to go to Ken, Ken Sale or whatever, whoever they are, Zane and so on, it'll be one person, maybe a public relations officer, who doesn't, who can't, uh, who doesn't have the scope and the ability to be able to cover this country. So what they end up with is exactly the same like others where they meet for a day and, and they meet orphans and they give them blankets and then you clap your hands and then you've done it. They, well, you haven't. So we are hoping that as we go on, we will have dialogue with them and tell them that it is more meaningful. Choose a few communities, assist them step by step, one at a time. There may be a thousand communities out there needing help, but start with one and do it well. So we are selling those concepts. One, that it will make a lot of sense to, to get a professional outfit that can do it for you. And two, to do one thing at a time, but in a very sustainable way.